And he was one of the most high-profile serial killers in the United States. Dennis Rader, known as the Bind, Torture, Kill, or BTK murderer, convicted of killing 10 people over the course of 17 years in Wichita, Kansas, currently serving 10 consecutive life sentences for his crimes. But to my guest, Rader was just her dad. In a new tell-all book, A Serial Killer's Daughter, My Story of Faith, Love, and Overcoming, Kelly Rawson talks about growing up with her father and what that was like. And she is standing by in our studios in downtown Toronto today. Carrie, thank you for taking some time to come on the program. Um, thank you for having me. How did you first find out that your father was a serial killer? Um, the FBI knocked on my door in February of 2005 and told me that they had arrested my father and they were pretty sure he was BTK. He had started communicating with the police again in 2004 after um, a couple decades of being quiet with his communications. And they had been looking for him for almost a year when they finally found him and arrested him. So they come to your door and what goes through your mind, Carrie? Just insanity, like why would the FBI be here? I was in Michigan, I grew up in Kansas um, where all this was happening, but I was in Michigan for the, for the last year. So you're just not, you're just trying to comprehend why would the FBI there, you're racking your brain. Then they tell you your dad's been arrested. You tell him they got the wrong guy. You're trying to alibi him. You're trying to like tell them like, you know, he's a Boy Scout leader, church president, a good father. And um, they know that they've already got the guy. So they're not, the agent wasn't buying anything I was saying. And as you begin to process what is going on, you realize what he had done. What was that like? Um, initially, I was in five days of shock from being notified and dealing with the FBI and the media. Um, within um, a day of his arrest, um, it was national news that he had been arrested, and they were saying on the national news incorrectly that I was, I had turned him in, which wasn't correct. And so there was just a lot of misinformation going out in the American news all over. Um, so you're just in like disbelief and shock. You're physically ill. You can't sleep. You can't eat. Um, it took five days. I was like four days before we were able to get me on a plane to get me back to Kansas to be with my family. Um, the media showed up on day two with their cameras already rolling in my hallway. Um, so, I mean, you're talking about months of being stalked by the media and years of trying to process and heal. Let me go back in time and ask you, what was family life like for you growing up with your dad? Um, I had a pretty normal childhood. Um, he was a really good father for the most part. We camped and we fished, we hiked. I walked the dog with him. We built a tree house. Um, we went to church every Sunday. Uh, we were pretty much just the all-American family. And I think that's really what comes across in your book, is that things seem to be so normal. You were part of that family, Carrie. I mean, that was your day-to-day -day life. And then this, and, and, you know, no signs, of course, for you. He was just dad. Yes, um, there was only, um, in hindsight now, we can see where, like, he had flashes of anger or controlling. He could be verbally abusive at times. And there were two incidences of physical violence against my brother when he was older. But... Like, I, I'm afraid our family just sort of dismissed it and thought that was the very worst we would ever have from my father. And we didn't really ever address it or talk about it. What has it been like for you personally since his arrest? Um, I mean, initially there was like the six months of just shock and trying to just deal with this new reality and how do you manage the media and how do you go forward in life. Um, and then my dad went through a plea and a sentencing and so after that, I tried to kind of just normalize my life. Um, but I ended up being in so much pain and dealing with um, post-traumatic stress disorder from the day he was arrested. I ended up back in therapy. So I, I've gone through like quite a bit of trauma therapy just to get the ground back under my feet. And then you just try to normalize your life and continue forward with the life you now have. And you are still in touch with him to a certain extent, correct? Y yes, we communicate through letters. Um, I've never um, spoken to him on the phone and I've never visited, even though I would be able to. Um, all I've been able to ever personally handle are letters. So we write back and forth a few times a year. Do you think down the line you may be able to see him in person? Um, I, would, I, I would like to see him before he um, gets any older. He's 73, so... Speaking from like that, he's my father and I still love my father. I would like to see him and, um, you know, 
like get to hug him one more time, but I also know you're not allowed to do that, that he's in another room on a video chained to a table and you're, be, you're behind glass like in a, another room. So reality is I'm never gonna get to be with my father again. I had the opportunity to go through your book before our interview, and, and I wanted to ask you why you chose to do this. Because again, you're coming out in a very public way. People are going to look at some very intimate details of what you have been through and, and, and you know the life you've led now ever since this all happened. Why did you want to write the book? For the, like, almost for a decade after he was arrested and the plea, I just prayed for a quiet private life, but it wasn't working because I was sort of just internalizing everything I was going through and, and almost having to hide who I was, like, on social media or in the communities we were in. And I finally just had, had enough and started speaking up in my hometown, Wichita, Kansas paper. And after I started speaking up, I realized that there was power in healing in sharing my own story and also my story was helping other people um, like PTSD. More veterans with PTSD were reaching out to me and like abuse and trauma victims and people with criminals in their families were saying something in my story was resonating with them. And I saw the power in, in healing and talking about these things and trying to remove that stigma from um, things that are very common, you know, everyone goes through. Yeah, you raise such a great point, this idea of catharsis and, and sort of accepting the reality that because of what happened, you are going to be in the spotlight, even if you don't necessarily want to be. So at least this way, you can take ownership, tell your story, and make sure it's on your terms, Carrie. Right. I mean, for the, for the first 10 years, I was BTK's daughter, and there was like this this kind of undercurrent of why isn't the family talking and what are they hiding when we weren't hiding anything, we were just trying to survive. And finally, you get to a point where you're just fed up with what's out there and you decide to start talking and sharing your story because talking helps you and then you're seeing that it's helping other people. And now, like, I am who I am and people can accept me or not accept me. And what's been the reaction to the book? Um, mainly overall, very positive. I, I've got, like, an inbox full on social media right now full of people just encouraging me and cheering me on and telling me to stay strong. Um, I have a few trolls that hit me on the internet and send terrible things either publicly or privately. Um, so that's sort of the reality, I think, just in this internet age, but also with somebody like me um, getting hit pretty often. Carrie, thank you for taking the time to come on CTV.